Thank you so much, Anya, for the very kind introduction. I hope that you can see my slides okay and in full screen mode. And actually, I would like to start off my presentation by congratulating the current ESA team on all the fantastic progress you guys have made over the last years. And it's really cool to see how amazing the ESA has made progress and advanced in these last years since I was a member years ago. So. I have structured my talk into three parts. I would like to tell you a little bit about what my job actually is at the moment. So what does Berlinger do as a company and what is my job in detail? Then I'm gonna move on to um, talking about how I got there and what my motivations were along the way. And as a third part, I have prepared some tips for you that I think could be helpful if you aspire to um, getting a similar job. So let's get started with the what. And I want to introduce um, the company I work for. So Berlinger Ingelheim is a family-owned corporation. They have always been a family business, and they are actually very proud that they are still family-owned. And they have three focus areas. So um, they work on human pharmaceuticals, but also on animal health and on biopharmaceutical contract manufacturing. Worldwide, BI has 52,000 employees. And of these 52,000 employees, um, roughly 8,800 work in R&D, so in research and development. Um, in the year 2020, uh, BI has spent roughly 3.7 billion euros on the R&D arm. Now, since Beringa is involved in every step of the process, um, that means that we are involved from discovering targets to discovering molecules, develop the, developing them into drugs, um, testing them extensively, and then all the way to testing them in the clinics, um, and finally also marketing them. For this, um, Berlinger has 16 production sites spread around the globe, and we have 176 affiliated companies. In 2020, uh, net sales of BI um, were roughly 19.6 billion euros, of which 14.4 billion euros came from human pharmaceuticals. Um, to get, together, this um, also attributes to the fact that BI is currently one of the top 20 pharmaceutical companies worldwide. Now, the research sites of BI are uh, located across the globe. There is the research site in Richfield in the US. Then there's the one um, in Biberach, uh, the one in Vienna where I work, and the one in Kobe in Japan. In my daily work, I collaborate closely with colleagues from the R&D sites in Biberach and in Richfield. And in addition to the BI research sites, the company has also acquired several uh, biotech companies that have now in, been included under the umbrella of BI, for example, MBE Therapeutics in Basel, or Amal in Geneva, and also ViraT located in Innsbruck. So the goal of cancer research in BI is to develop drugs that target proteins that are very commonly deregulated in cancer. So as you can see on the slide, um, there is millions of cancer patients with mutations in KRAS or beta catenin signaling. And together with P53 and MYC, KRAS and beta catenin are termed cancer speak four because they are most commonly altered. Until several years ago, these targets, um, however, were deemed undruggable because they lack the proper binding pocket for drugs. But with the recent advances in medicinal chemistry and structural biology, we are now finally finding ways to actually drug these previously undruggable targets. And BI's focus is on doing that with small molecules, so NCEs, but also with antibodies or antibody-like biological entities. So as to what my job actually is, I'm currently an associate principal scientist in the department Oncology Translational Sciences. So in my daily work, my main task is to lead a team of lab scientists. That means that I am not in a lab anymore myself, but much rather I design lab experiments, I analyze data, um, and I do a lot, I spend a lot of my time in meetings actually. Um, discussing projects and project work. Um, and all of this, um, I do this with the help of a really great team of lab scientists. So the main 
task is to profile drugs candidates in the stage just before they enter the first clinical trial. So mainly we identify biomarkers and we aim at establishing PKPD relationships. So what does that mean? That means that um, we try to gather data from in vitro studies, but also from in vivo studies, mainly in mice. And we try to understand the relationship of the pharmacokinetics with the pharmacodynamics so that we understand what amount of those we need to use to get a certain effect so that once we go into the clinic, we have a rough idea of what those we have to treat the patient with to get the expected outcome. So I mainly develop uh, biomarker strategies. I validate them um, after developing them preclinically. So that's mainly done with in vitro um, experiments and mouse models. And we validate them in order to support um, the initial clinical trials. Furthermore, I collaborate closely with academic partners and contract research organizations. And this is in order to um, investigate new technologies that can be used to discover new biomarkers. Now, moving on to the second part of my talk is how I got to having this job and, and, and what my motivation was along the way. So as was mentioned in the introduction, um, I obtained a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry um, from the Graz University of Technology. And I already um, realized during my bachelor's studies that I had an interest in biochemistry. So um, I then did a master's degree in biochemistry, also again at the Graz University of Technology. During my master's, I already um, did a master thesis in cancer research. And I knew that I wanted to do also a PhD in that field. So I applied for a PhD program at the Medical University of Graz. And I, after finishing my PhD there um, in basic research, I stayed on for a postdoc in the field of tumor biology. After that, I wanted to transition to the industry. And after applying to many different jobs and having a rough time going through all the interviews, I finally landed a job in a small biotech startup um, located here in Vienna called OncoOne. Um, OncoOne is a company that works on antibodies and antibody-based therapeutics. So I got to learn a lot about NDEs there. And in June of last year, I finally was able to um, transition to BI and I hold this position as an associate principal scientist since last year. Now, as you can see on the top of the slide, this is like my formal CV, but I also wanna mention what I consider um, equally important. And those are the things that I did outside of my uh, formal education. So for example, in 2011, um, I got the opportunity to do a research stay um, at Syracuse University, that's um, in the state of New York in the US, was like a summer exchange program between chemistry students from Graz and Syracuse. Um, and a year later, uh, I had the opportunity of doing an EIS internship at Cardiff University. And this was actually one of the first um, real um, experiences I had in, in, doing, in, re in doing research in the biofield, basically. Another really cool thing that I got the opportunity to participate in was a biocamp organized by Sando uh, in Slovenia. And that was like a super intense experience, but it was super rewarding. Um, it was about um, immunotherapy and it had like a competition where we had to come up you know, with a presentation on, on a topic. And finally, last but not least, I wanted, want to mention that I was actually part of the um, ESA South branch. Um, from, I think, 2016 to 2019, where, um, where that Pascal set up back at the time. And as a member of the ESA South branch, um, I had the opportunity to organize, like, you know, science dinners. And um, I also organized a company visit to Sando, where I used these contacts that I had from the biocamp. Now, since I'm a scientist, I want to talk to you a little bit about the science I actually did during my time in academia. And this is mostly um, to give you a bit of perspective and to encourage you if you have the feeling that whatever you're doing right now is just basic research, which is often the case. Um, but nevertheless, it can really lay the groundstone for your future work. So during my master thesis, I um, did some cell culture work. I tested some plant extracts 
Um, they were really nicely killing the cells in the Petri dish. And I even got a little paper out of it. And, and I remember um, wondering back then already, like, okay, this is great. These compounds to kill the cells in vitro, but what's going to happen now? Like, okay, I published it, but I'm moving on to the next stage. Who's ever going to read this? And who is ever going to do anything with that? Well, the truth is probably nobody ever read it. So then I moved on to my PhD. I did a PhD um, in basic research investigating colorectal cancer. And specifically, I was looking at various uh, chi protein coupled receptors. So we knocked them out in the mice and then induced colorectal cancer in these mice and checked whether the mice uh, would grow less tumors and so on. And so basically, this was um, very, very basic research. And in my postdoc time, I got to mentor a brilliant PhD student, Melanie, and together with her, uh, we would do multiple mouse models where, so syngenetic mouse models where we would engraft cell lines in the flank of the mice, let them grow for two weeks, um, and then extract the tumors, um, digest them, and look at the tumor infiltrating uh, leukocytes by doing some fancy flow cytometry. All right. so. Now I want to move on to the to the last part of my talk, um, where I've collected what I would say are some tips. They are really just personal tips that I would like to give to you. So one of the things I've experienced uh, while applying for Berlinga was that you do have to be academically excellent to be considered for a position at BI. So in that regard, it's really important that you have a proper track record. That means that you can show that you have published in good journals, that you have published multiple things. Um, and ideally that maybe your uh, scientific work was also awarded with some prizes along the way, like maybe poster, best poster awards or best talk awards um, or, or those kind of awards. Um, and ideally um, you can also show some international experience. It, now, I know this is a difficult topic sometimes. Um, do I have to go abroad? Do I not have to go abroad? Um, but it's really something that they pay attention to when you apply to them. And now, the second most important thing, or maybe it is even the most important thing, I'm not sure, but I would say it's networking. And I know you've all heard this a lot probably, and by being here today, you're definitely on the right path. But I wanna emphasize it just one more time because I think it's really so important that you do it and that you do it from early onwards. So if you have the chance, um, go to those conferences, go to student conferences if you can, even while you're still a master's student. Um, try to participate in student organizations if you have the opportunity. Um, as you can see here, these are just pictures I, 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 I wanted to share because they are from my time when I was a member of the ESA South branch, um, when together with Pascal and Melanie and Julian, we were organizing back in the day some science dinners or some you know, other excursions. Um, and another thing I would like to highlight is that I, I have made the, had the experience that having a LinkedIn profile is also very important. So not just having one, but actually making it meaningful, like creating content on your LinkedIn profile, because people, when they receive your CV and they want to talk about, they want to find out more about you, they will go and Google you, or they will go and find out um, or look up your LinkedIn profile. And having a LinkedIn profile that, that just shares a little bit about your experience, your education and so on can be really useful for people to get a first glimpse of, of your skills. And then another thing I would like to mention is that I consider it very important that you, if you think about switching from um, academia to industry, that you do what I would call active transitioning. So uh, by that, I mean that you find a way to show your future employer that you really want to work in the industry, meaning that you're not just running away from academia because you get sick and tired of it. No, much rather that you did some extra work to understand what it would be like working in the industry, um, what the differences are, and um, really showing this active interest in, in, in transitioning. And, and I've just listed here a few things that I think you could do is like taking extracurricular courses, 
There are some that uh, on Coursera, for example, that are quite helpful. Um, there is this blog from Native Jobs that is super helpful if you don't have any idea yet of what you want to do. They describe all kinds of jobs that you can do with a scientific background. Um, and then also, yeah, like attending events like you are doing today, you're on the right path. And so, for example, I attended the ESA event that was um, held in March last year, um, which was a full day workshop by BI. And I attended that and, I, and that was really helpful for me. And as my final message to you, uh, I would like to say that it is important to stand out. If you have anything about yourself that is extraordinary, make them see it. Because um, BI as an employer, they receive so many CVs and they receive so many excellent CVs that all look the same. They're all filled with academic accomplishment, with um, staying abroad experiences and so on. So if you have anything about yourself that makes you stand out, that makes them want to read your CV or your application, that is really, really helpful. Um, and also, well, as you know, it can be really, really tough to get to where you want to be. The path of doing a PhD, doing a postdoc, the interviewing and all of that, it's very often not so easy. So that's why I put here that you also should not forget to live a little. And with this, I'm at the end of my talk, and I'd like to invite you to ask me any of your questions. Thank you, Karina, for your very nice talk and for sharing your experiences. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and as I said, let's move to the Q&A session. Are there any questions in the chat, maybe? OK, maybe then I can start. Uh, can you describe your normal day? Uh, as an associate principal. So you said you don't work in the lab anymore, right? Yes, so that, that's mm -hmm. true. I don't work in the lab anymore. Um, I basically spend um, all my day at the computer or like, you know, now with COVID times, it's, it's all in online meetings, I think in normal times. So I was onboarded during the pandemic, right? So I have only experienced it in pandemic times. So I don't know what it would be like or what it will be like once we come back to the office. Um, but since I joined, I've mostly uh, worked from home, actually. Um, we are supposed to come back uh, on site 50% of the time as soon as the pandemic situation allows it. Um, and, but still, most of my work is um, designing experiments, analyzing data, being in meetings with other project team members. So in BI, projects are organized in so-called project teams. That means that a person of each function is represented there. So you have all the different disciplines together working on a project. Um, and depending on the stage that the project is in, the meetings are of course a bit different. But in my job, uh, basically I, I deal with uh, drug candidates that are um, already gone through the lead identification stage and are in the lead optimization stage. So we try to get them ready in terms of profiling so that they can enter the first clinical trial. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and I see we have some questions in the chat. So first question is by Melanie and she wonders, can you tell a little bit about the interview process? Was something challenging or surprising? Yes, of course I can walk you through that. So I'm um, gonna be honest with you, it took me four attempts to get the position that I got now. So meaning that I have applied to BI four times before uh, I got this position. Um, and the first two times I was really just turned down right from the beginning. So I didn't even make it past this initial stage uh, of just submitting your document. Um, and what was different the time around when I actually got the position is that um, I had my former bachelor supervisor already working at BI and I contacted, contacted her the moment I heard about the position that I applied for and I asked her for more details. If she could share with me um, what, the, what the work, what the job was gonna be about um, or if she knew any of the people that were actually hiring. And that was really the key element in the end because she knew the people of, of that department and she talked to them and they literally went and checked out my LinkedIn profile right away. And then they saw, okay, that I did a bachelor's in chemistry and that resonated well with them because it's really important even at a, a job 
um, in translational sciences to be able to talk to the chemists. Um, and, and so this really was the first step into getting invited for the next round that, um, yeah, they had me, they, that they looked me up and that I had my former supervisor make them look at my profile and, and see and see it. Um, and then the process was that I was invited for a, a to, like a telephone call, although it wasn't teams, but it was like a, a one hour session where I had to present the highlights of my research. So that was quite crazy for me because I had already been working in the industry for two years and I had to go back to my PhD data, you know, the, the PhD data, the postdoc data that I hadn't been thinking about in two entire years, but I had to put them back together in a slide and, you know, sell them um, in, a, in like a 10 minute presentation to show what I did academically. Um, even though I thought I would never have to deal with that ever again. But then I was invited to a six hour interview where I was um, where the first point of the agenda was to give a 45 minute presentation about my academic work. And again, you know, all I had was the work from the PhD and the postdoc that I was allowed to talk about. So then I really had to, um, you know, read my thesis again and um, put together a proper presentation um, with data that had been generated like, I don't know, six, seven years ago. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then you just you finish your talk and then you go through one on one interviews um, and it lasts on, on average, it lasts like six hours, this interviews. Um, and then later on, they notify you about the outcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There is another question uh, by Jose. If the academic background is not directly on pharma, but related, for example, analytical chemistry, is there a chance to join BI? In your opinion? I would say so. I mean, um, BI also has positions in the analytical department, right? So we also need um, people who work in, uh, with different skills and so on. So for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and Dina is asking, uh, how did you make your CV stand out? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. And I, what I would say is that maybe not so much my CV stood out, but I managed to get to talk to people, you know? So, um, and, and, and this is, I think this is one of the most important things that I took away from it is um, take advantage of the networking opportunities you have. Like I myself attended the OGMBT conferences in Graz, in Vienna. And I think these are really such key moments because you get to meet so many people from the industry um, in the, because of the way that the meetings are organized with all these stands you had in pre-pandemic times again. Uh, but where you got to connect with uh, representatives of the industry um, and where you have this social event scheduled in, where you have the, the wine, the science in the evening, the wine time and so on. Uh, and this is where you really get to make those connections and where you start having people that, you know, later on can put as a reference maybe on your CV or who who could even like vouch for you, who, who I've, so I've had this experience that I, I knew someone who would then vouch for me and saying, yeah, like, she's really good. Like, you should really give her the job because I've had this and this experience with her. I've told her this and this and she had issues and then we did troubleshooting together and so on. And she's like, really, whatever. But so I think these are the, the, the key moments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the last question by Yulia. Oh, no, not last question, but let's say last <laughs> question. Uh, when switching from science to industry, what was the biggest culture shock for you? Um, there are many, I'm not going to lie. There are many, it's, it's very different, um, in the industry. Um, the pace is much faster in terms of what, during your PhD, you've got roughly three to four years to work on your project and you really focus on this one project and you have a beginning. And, and if you don't have to change projects in between, then you have one project that you're working on for really three to four years. Um, and in the industry, the pace is faster, like um, priorities change all the time, you know, and have to be able to adapt to that because um, management might have to focus on this particular project now and then everything needs to happen now. Resources are shifted to accommodate for that. But if a project isn't going well, they are much quicker to also terminate them. So then you need to refocus and you might be put on another project. Um, so I think that that's one of the, the most, so in your daily life, you feel that the most, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And now the last question by Marie. Uh, do you think it's easier to switch to industry after PhD or after postdoc? Postdocs in big 
in the big pharma companies are incredibly competitive. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. Um, for BI, uh, you have to have a postdoc, that's clear. So I tried applying the first time while I was in my first year of postdoc, and that was just not interesting to them at all. They want you to have postdoc experience, um, roughly four years of experience. Post-PhD is the average where people start in this kind of um, leadership roles like a um, principal scientist is. So for me, obviously, it was not four years of postdoc, but it was like two years of postdoc and two years in the industry. Um, that ultimately got, got, gave me the opportunity to get this job, but uh, it might be different for other companies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, well, I guess that's it uh, for the Q&A session. <laughs>